Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. A lot of people recently have been asking me if I could do a demo about how we've been doing our fresh baked homemade bread. With the stay at home orders, not wanting to go to the grocery store very much, we've been trying to do a lot of more homemade stuff and bread is featured in a lot of the recipes we've done lately. Some of you guys have been watching on the community tab, I've been sharing you know, the nightly recipes kind of things we've been doing along those lines and bread is something that pops up in a lot of it. So people have asked me if I could do a demo about it. One of the things that made me nervous about starting starting to make bread way back before I started doing it was it just seemed like it was a really involved process. Uh, you know, you, there's the, the rising and then the kneading and then you got all the, the dishes to clean and everything. It just seemed like it was a lot of work. It was just so easy to run out to the grocery store and buy bread and during normal times that is the case. But making bread is nowhere near as difficult or as time consuming as I had feared and it's probably the same for you guys. So I want to share my process. Something else that we do here is that we don't use store-bought yeast anymore. I've been growing my own yeast in this jar here and that was something that had terrified me before I started it. It seemed like, oh my god, you know, what kind of science experiment is this going to turn into? Am I going to poison myself? This is actually super easy as well. So I'm going to go over the whole process of growing your own yeast, using that yeast, making bread, and you'll see how really simple it is. One thing I want to point out before I begin is that one of the ways that uh, you can save a lot of time in the process is by not cleaning your bowls all the time. If you're always using the same bowl for making bread, you know, you don't really have to go and scrub it out because next time you make bread, you know, it's, you know, some of this little, there's some cornmeal in here, there's some little flakes of flour, some of this stuff is just going to get incorporated into the next uh, bread, and that's no big deal. Now, I've shared the fact that I you know, I'm kind of like that a lot of times. Like here is my dried chili from a couple days ago. It's just, you know, it's crispy, all baked, sitting on the stove. Some people have, uh, you know, told me that's crazy. You know, you do that, you're gonna poison yourself. Well, the simple fact that my doing something hasn't killed me yet is not direct evidence that it's not dangerous. You know, you can't go out and do something, you know, crazy and then say, well, I survived, so it was never dangerous to begin with. But if you start doing that over and over again, hundreds if not thousands of times, and you're still fine, it's probably evidence that maybe people's fears about certain things are maybe a bit unfounded. If you're leaving things out and they're drying pretty immediately, they're not stewing in liquid or whatever, it seems, at least in my extensive experience, that it's not really a big deal. And it can save you a whole ton of time and that's food right there. We're gonna preserve that and we're gonna put that into the next bread. So not cleaning these bowls, not cleaning the pans that you bake the stuff on. You know, these just get more and more seasoned with time too. So, you know, you can save an enormous amount of time there. Like just dedicate some things you're gonna to use to your bread baking and don't worry about cleaning them all the time. It'll save you a bunch of time, save you nutrition and mostly save you aggravation. So let's start off. The first step in making your bread in this bowl here is to get your yeast. Now. If you were going to be using store-bought yeast, you know, you just throw in the yeast packet, that's what you do. But I'm growing ours in here, and what we're going to do is just scoop some out. There's a, uh, this has been in the refrigerator, there's some bubbles in here, it smells like, you know, yeast. I'm just going to scoop what's in here out, leaving a little bit in there. You know, just kind of like whatever didn't come out, you know, this thousands or millions of little bacteria, you know, the yeast creatures in there still. And what we're going to do is freshen this up before we get into the bread making where you're going to keep this colony going. So the first step is grab some whole wheat flour. This is white flour and this is whole wheat flour. And you want to feed the yeast in a certain ratio. You want to give them about 50% more flour than you do water. You want to feed them flour and water. So I'm going to put one two, three scoops of flour in here. And you'll notice that it was pretty easy to aim them in there because I chose a jar that has a pretty wide mouth. Uh, initially when I was doing this, I had a, a smaller mouth jar. It was kind of harder to aim these guys in. Uh, so, you know, if you're doing this yourself, a jar with a wider mouth, it's, it's an easier target. Uh, in terms of what this sizes, this is a quarter cup, but you could do it any size you want. It's the important thing is the ratio. So we did three cups of this. So we're gonna do two cups of water. And this is filtered water. It's not like right out of the tap. You know, our, our, our tap water here is well water anyway, but you, if you have municipal water and there could be chlorine in it or something, you don't want to be killing your bleach with chlorine. So this is filtered water I'm using. I've, I've just always used filtered water anyway. 
So I did three cups of flour and we're going to do two cups of water. When I take a bunch of the yeast out, I'll usually do three cups flour, two cups water. But, uh, you know, when I only take a little bit out, sometimes I'll just do a cup and a half of flour and then one cup of water. It's the ratio that's important. Three parts flour, two parts water. So there we go. We got the flour in, we got the water in. This is usually a lot faster when I'm not talking too. Uh, and I'm just kind of taking some of the dried stuff from the top and kind of trying to push it down in there a little bit. You don't have to, it just I feel like it keeps it cleaner. Uh, and all, all you do is you just homogenize it. Stir it around and you're essentially just making a dough in there and the dough is going to be the food for the bacteria, the yeast that was left in there. Once it's kind of all homogenized, you don't see any dry pockets or whatever. I'm using a chopstick, by the way. I find chopsticks are pretty effective for this. Take the chopstick out. Try to keep all the yeast in there. Keep your colony happy before you kill them later. And done. Now, if I want to make bread again, like tomorrow or the day after, uh, I would just take this and just leave it on the counter like that. If I think it's going to be a while before I want to make bread again, maybe I do it weekly, I will take this and I'll put it in the refrigerator and that'll really slow down the action on the, the yeast growing. So if you think it's going to be a week or so, you know, put it in the fridge. If you're going to do it you know, right away, just leave it out on the counter. And what you'll see is this will start getting all bubbly and it'll probably at least double in size in terms of the volume that it seems to take up in the jar. One thing that I want to mention is when you're putting the lid on, you don't want to tighten it too much. Just kind of loosely put it on there because uh, they're going to be creating gas bubbles. That's why they make the bread fluffy and you don't want them to be, you know, in a pressure environment. I don't know, maybe they'd like it, but I'm just assuming just leave it so that the gas can escape and you're not pressurizing anything. So that's done. That's all there is to making your own yeast is you just take the stuff out and then give it some food and water and then, you know, put it off to the side until you need it next time. Let's get into the bread making. So we've got this slop in the dirty bowl here. And I'm going to be adding the two ingredients that I usually add for uh, bread, which is some wheat flour, some white flour, uh, salt, and I guess if you want to count water, that's a fourth ingredient. So uh, let's start with, uh, I guess we got the wheat flour right here. You can watch the degree to which you need to be meticulous. I'm just kind of dumping this in there. Make a little, little mountain with that wheat flour. About, you know that much and this is going to make like a loaf of bread that'll kind of about about fill this this little uh, pan there we'll take some white flour uh, the, the reason I'm mixing the wheat and the white flour is that you know you could make it with all white or you could make it with all I'm not gonna I didn't want to talk while I was tapping that so you could hear me uh, you could make it with all white, you could make it with all wheat. Uh, the advantage of all wheat is that there's more fiber in it and that's good for you. The advantage of all white is that it's fluffier and more delicious. So I kind of combine the two so you get like the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds, I guess, <laughs> depending on the, the way you want to look at it. But I, I do about a half and half kind of mix. If I want it to be a little extra fluffy, I put a little more of the white flour. If I want it to be a little bit healthier, I guess, I put a little bit more of the whole wheat. So we got a little mountain here. So we had our, our little lump of yeast stuff. We put a mountain on top. The next ingredient is salt and I'm going to be grabbing some salt. This is an old pretzel uh, bag uh, with some pretzel rods. You'll notice in the bottom of these things there's always extra salt at the bottom. There's also extra crumbs but it doesn't matter. The crumbs will just get in, incorporated into the bread. So we've got some salt here and I'm going to just spread it across the top of our little pile. You want to kind of give it the like a little dusting as though it's like a mountain and you get like a dusting of snow on the top of it. What I put there looked like maybe I need a little bit more salt. So I'm going to take this just some sea salt and give it a little more like that, something like that. I mean, if you put too much, the bread will be a little salty tasting. If you put too little, it will taste a little bit bland. Uh, you know, if it tastes a little bland, you can always just add butter or something like that later on. If it tastes too salty, it's kind of like, well, lesson learned, don't do that again, I guess. Um, so that, that's it, that, those are the ingredients. And that's the degree to which you really need to measure them. Make a mountain, give it a little you know, snow dusting of salt. You know, you'll learn over time, you know, how much is the right amount. Uh, and then we're going to add some water. I'm not going to measure this either, but what I'm looking for is homogeny. I want to just get everything together so it kind of feels like a mush. The nice thing is if you add too much water, you just add a little more flour. And if you don't have enough water, you just add more. If you make it too dry, 
it's not going to fluff up as much while the yeast is growing. It'll be kind of like a, you know, it'll be a denser bread. If you make it too wet, then it is going to kind of turn into like a, a slop sort of structure and there won't be enough integrity to the, the dough to really hold the bubbles. So like when the, the yeast makes the bubbles later, the bubbles just, they won't get trapped in the matrix of, of the flour. They'll just kind of bubble right out. So, so that's kind of the balance that you're looking for is you want something that's gonna hold the bubbles and not just be like slop, but you want it to be moist enough so that you know it's not like just a dense bread that doesn't have any fluffiness to it. You know, so right here, uh, you know, it's feeling like dough, but it's got a little bit of powder on the outside. And at the end, you gotta be really, really judicious about the water you put at the end. Just a little bit goes a long way. So I just put a little bit to kind of wet the bottom of the bowl. And this is getting there. Just like that. See how it's kind of grabbing the spoon? It's going around like that. As I mix, it's kind of following me around. All right, cool. So this is this is pretty good. This is where you want it, right around there. So the next step at this point is put it down. I'm just gonna use something to kind of get the, the dough off the spoon here. There we go. And we just wanna leave this at this point. I'm just gonna put a lid on there, it's just a pot lid. And we just wanna let it sit. Uh, it'd be ideal if you could have this kind of go for the whole day. So let it sit here for, I don't know, a couple hours, and then you give it another stirring, just like I did. Uh, you, people talk about kneading the dough, you take it out and you're kind of working it like that. I never really like that because my wrists always bother me when I try to put pressure on them in that direction. Uh, they don't like it. Uh, so I, I, I adopted all these kind of like knead with your knuckles or whatever. Uh, but then I found out that you can do a pretty effective kneading job by just stirring it around. The point of kneading is to take all the fibers uh, that are in, this is like my metaphor for, for it, I don't know if they're actually fibers, but they're, you know, maybe there's like protein chains or I don't know what, what, what they are, but it's kind of like the, similar to the idea of creating felt where you would take uh, wool and you get it all kind of gnarled up on itself and like all those kind of fibers entangle and they make this like dense, springy, delicious web of their, fibery, amino acid -y, whatever. Uh, that's the idea. You want to get it, the bread kind of tangled on itself. Uh, I usually like to do that kneading, stirring kind of thing, you know, at least two times, three times, uh, you know, I think makes it even a little bit more springy when you make the dough. So let it sit for a few hours. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be in the dark. It doesn't have to be particularly warm. I just leave it on the counter at room temperature. Leave it there a couple hours, give it a stir. You know, once it seems like it's kind of softened and it's like starting to bubble up and then repeat that, you know, at least one more time, maybe two more times. And then your last step is that you would uh, take it and you just put it in the pan. The way that I prepare the pans, I put a little bit of olive oil on it, spread it around. I'll take some cornmeal, cornmeal. Don't skimp the cornmeal step. The cornmeal step really makes it way easier to take the bread out later on. So I'll take some cornmeal and just kind of scatter a little cornmeal around. You don't have to have, have like a, like a, doesn't have to look like a beach or anything. It just, just a little sprinkle is fine. It's almost like perforations on a page. Uh, you know, if you have like there's these little dots on the edge of your page, it makes it easy to rip the page out. Same kind of thing. You got these little specks around on your tray. It makes it much easier to kind of break the bond between the bread and the pan later on. Uh, in terms of getting the bread out of the bowl, later on, this is gonna be all uh, like swollen up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some cornmeal, just sprinkle it around the edges, and then I'm gonna take my hand and kind of scoop around the whole periphery of the, uh, uh, the dough, and then take the whole thing and just flip it upside down right on top of the pan. The dough will fall out into the pan. And at that point, you just wanna kind of let it sit for a while you know, maybe let it rise for another, you know, half hour, hour, or something like that, and then pop it into an oven. In terms of the temperature of what the oven should be running at, it's really kind of up to your mood. You know, I, I, I cook bread anywhere between 350 to 500 to 550 degrees. It's usually I'm, I kind of feel like I want, I'm, it's like a 425 day or a 450 day or something like that. Uh, but really there's a huge uh, range of temperatures that are acceptable for baking bread. Uh, and uh, the thing you just want to make sure you do is you don't want it to burn on the outside. So the high temperatures, you know, risk burning the outside. They also risk crisping the outside and making it really delicious. Um, and you want to make sure that it cooks all the way through. So uh, when you take the bread out of the oven, you want to take a wire, like some kind of a probe or something. You, you know, they have these specialty cooking probes that you can use that like you know you poke into them to make sure that the dough on the inside is 
cook through. And the way you know is if the dough, if the probe comes out and it has wet, you know, sticky, gooey, uncooked dough, then you know, okay, well, it's not cooked on the inside. Um, you could buy like a specialty probe. I've I have a couple of them. One is made out of uh, the the little metal handles from Chinese food containers. I just took one of those, straightened it out, and I use that for my cooking probe. So it doesn't have to be anything special, just some kind of a wire you can poke into the bread and test it to make sure that it's cooked all the way through on the inside. Uh, then just take it, leave it on a, a little cooling rack for you know just a few minutes, usually around here. We can't wait that long because it's so delicious and it just smell, uh, makes the whole house smell like fresh baked bread. Everyone's uh, you know anxious to dive into it. But that's it. I mean, so you saw the process of putting it together and what you saw is the majority of it. The rest is just kind of sitting, waiting, you know, stirring it a couple times. And when I talk about stirring it, it's just like, I don't know, less than a minute. Just, just kind of, uh, stir the thing around until it kind of like collapses, the bubbles kind of knock out of it, and then give it another chance to, uh, to rise again. So that's it. I hope you give it a try. You know, you're going to get better at it over time. I know I've gotten better at it over time. I don't really know any specific thing that I've learned over time, but just, I, I don't know, your, your technique when you're doing stuff like this uh, just tends to uh, you know, grow as you do it. And then once you feel like you've got it down, think about adding some other things to it. You could add, you know, poppy seeds or quinoa or you know, any, any types of different ingredients you want to add in there, either for health or flavor or texture or anything like that. Hell, you know, I can take all these, this, these chili scrapings and take some of this. I'm, I'm going to do it right now. Watch this. Watch this happen. Bang. Just put some of that in there. Cool. So that's going to add some nutrition, that'll add some flavor, and it'll add some beautiful color to it later on. So you can get creative later on and try all sorts of different things and find out what works for you. That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.